Now, as we close our uh, study in the Ten Commandments, we're going to look uh, naturally enough, I hope, at the last one that's uh, in our Bibles. Uh, well, I suppose that's up for debate, really, isn't it? Because uh, Jesus spoke about a new command that he was going to give us, uh, that we love one another. But I guess that's uh, encapsulated within these Ten Commandments. And uh, in Exodus chapter 20, and verse 17, we have uh, this last summary of God's mind and God's uh, will for us in covenant relationship with Him. And uh, we have these words on page 70, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Now, just by way, very briefly, by way of introduction, we remind ourselves that these commands are given into a specific historical situation. Uh, covenant people of God in the Old Testament. Not many of us will have a problem, I don't imagine, with coveting our neighbor's donkey. Uh, but there is a much wider principle that is uh, encapsulated in the words of this command, as I hope we've seen in all of the commands. But it's interesting, you know, that I think sometimes, uh, subconsciously, we possibly think, okay, I can do this. I can do the commands. I can at least really make a, a strong stab at them, particularly the not murdering, the keeping the Lord's day, the not stealing, the not committing adultery. And, you know, we've, we've talked about how all of these commands Jesus takes in the New Testament and uh, he broadens them into our thoughts and into our motives. But for some reason, uh, we easily forget that here, right in the core of the Old Testament, the commands move beyond the outward. And they, if you thought you were close to obeying any of the commands up till now, well, now you're nailed completely because you have no chance because here, God is reminding even the Old Testament people of God. And I think we often forget this. We, we often think the Old Testament religion was very outward, was very ritualistic, was very about obedience, outward obedience. But here, God reminds us right at the heart of His mind and will that uh, His standard reaches, reaches right into our hearts and right into our desires and what we're thinking about. And that's what's so challenging for us and encouraging as well because the gospel is all about God being able to change our hearts and our desires. So we come tonight and we think this is far too difficult and it's far too troubling and far too problematic um, and I, I can't deal with these things. And the great thing is that that's exactly uh, at least what, partly what the commands are about. They're, they're driving us uh, to the foot of the cross and to the Savior Jesus himself. It's easy for us, isn't it? It's much, much easier for us to just stick with outward religion. It's much easier for us just to just go to church on a Sunday, even just to read the Bible or be morally upright. It's much easier to do these tangible things, things that we can at the end of the day say, okay, I've had a decent day today. I haven't, you know, I haven't done things that are wrong. I've done my best. I've tried my hardest. And it's easier for us to think like that. And Satan would have us think like that so often so that we're self-deceived and we think we don't need Jesus Christ on a daily basis. The difficulty, I think, and the problem sometimes with our understanding of the Ten Commandments is uh, that they can, in us, lead to legalism. We can be ticking boxes as to which we obey. It can also lead to uh, judgmentalism. We like to tick the boxes other people are obeying or not. And uh, it can lead us to uh, a deception about ourselves that we don't need changed in the inside and we don't need uh, to be uh, re born anew. That's a really bad place. There's, the worst person in the world is the religious hypocrite, isn't it? The worst person in the world is someone who has religion but doesn't have the Savior, doesn't have Christ, doesn't have redemption. That's the most horrible place to be. It's the most kind of cold, uh, icy, 
lonely, difficult place to be. It's the most frustrating place for us to be. But the great thing that we're reminded of here is that this is a, a, a window into God's mind. It's a window into God's will and God's desire for us. We're going to just slowly move through this commandment together this evening. It's a very interesting commandment. I think in some ways it's last, and this is simply a kind of visual picture, it's going to last because it, in many ways it holds up the other nine. Uh, it's, it's like the veins of this command reach into all the other nine commands. Uh, there's an interesting book by a, a pastor in London called, he's called J. John, and his, uh, his book on the Ten Commandments is called, I think, Ten, originally. Uh, but he, interestingly, and it is original, he uh, works through the commandments from the end. He starts at the tenth and works forward. And he's not trying to be smart. Uh, he's uh, not trying to be different. And he's not trying to say he knows better than God, obviously. Uh, but it's just interesting because there's much that is, is true uh, in recognizing uh, that in the, the tenth commandment, the, covet, the desiring of our hearts uh, and the wrong desiring of our hearts it reaches into all the other commandments. And it's a reminder, isn't it, for us that God, the painful truth, every time we come to school, I, I sometimes wonder why you come back every week. You know that you don't get rubbed, spiritually rubbed on the back and told lovely things every time you come. But each time we come to God's Word, there's painful truth, isn't there? And the, the painful truth that the commandments remind us is that God requires perfection. It's not just what we look like. It's not just how we act outwardly. But it's, an, it's inward perfection also, our desires. This commandment's all about coveting, which is wrong desires. And so he's saying that you need to have perfect and right desires and right intentions. We come to church tonight and God is saying, I don't just see you. It's a remarkable fact that God is saying, I don't just see what you're like on the outside. I know what you're thinking. I know your desires this evening. That's what he's saying. And he's saying, I judge your desires. And I judge them and they are found wanting. That's what he says of each of us. Our uh, secret thoughts expose for all of us our huge need of a redeemer because he is the revealer, the judge and the revealer of our thoughts. We sit here this evening and we're clothed and in our right minds, most of us. But God sees beyond this exterior that is life that we live. And it exposes our deep-seated problem. And what's your deep-seated problem and my deep-seated problem this evening? In the remaining, if we're Christians, in the remaining sin that's in our hearts, and if we're not Christians, at the very core of your being, is you wish you were someone else. That's at the very core of your, and that's the core of wrong and sinful desires. You wish you were someone else. You wish you lived somewhere else. You wish you did something else. You wish your life wasn't yours because you want, you covet something you don't have. And it's at the very, can you see what I mean when I say that it's the core of maybe all the other commands? You, you know, we read about that in James. You, you don't have because you have the wrong desires and you want to spend them on wrong things. And it causes grief and anger and jealousy and division. And you, you could take it to the first table of the law, to the first com early commandments and apply them because in a sense, wasn't it coveting that, that was the great sin of, well, we could talk about pride or you could, you could talk about independent or different things, but maybe coveting was what Adam and Eve did, was it not, in the garden? Was it not the root of their great sin? I want to be God. I, w I don't want him to rule over me. I want to listen to what Satan says and I want a bit of God. I want that independence. I'm not going to die you too, Satan said, you too can be like God. He, ins he provoked covet a covetous spirit within them that they could be what actually, of course, they couldn't be, sinful desires. 
And it's that powerful force that we fight against within us as Christians. Wishing we were someone else, somewhere else, doing something else. Not where we are, not where God has placed us, not the person that God made us. We want to be something else. And it can be a hugely destructive force within us, uncontainable, humanly unchangeable, unstoppable. And it enslaves us because we can never be released. We can never be free as we are, as God intended us to be by grace, always looking over our shoulder, always wanting something else, always desiring what we don't have, always looking uh, away from Christ. And of course, the reality of that is the deception of sin and the deception of uh, those who uh, have not yet fallen in with Christ. So, number 10, coveting. It's really legally and outwardly, it's unenforceable. You you couldn't put this on the statute books of uh, the New Scotland uh, if we were to gain independence. You couldn't do it. You couldn't have the Tenth Commandment as a command that was enforceable by law even though we know that many of the, the commands uh, or many of the, or, or our legal system is based on uh, these, uh, at least some of these commands. But it separates us out from just a, a legal obedience, doesn't it? It's a reminder that God's law is different, that God is different, that God uh, knows our hearts. And tonight, I think that's a really in many ways, it'd be good just to stop for five minutes and just let you think about that as, you know, meditate on that for a moment, that God, uh, we can't hide from God. Wasn't that the most absurd thing about the garden? Wasn't it that, that Adam and Eve, having known who God was and understanding who God was, thought that they could hide from Him, from what they'd done, behind a bush? Isn't that amazing that they thought that, that they could hide from? And, and don't we do it all the time by not praying, by being busy in our work, by doing a, a myriad of different things, hiding from God? You know, it's like the little child who's playing hide and seek and who covers his eyes and thinks that no one can see them because they're covering their eyes. But of course, everyone can see them unless they, they hide properly. And sometimes we're like that with God. We think that we just don't look at Him or don't pray to Him or or don't deal with Him. Somehow He can't see what we're doing. And He's one who knows intimately our lives and knows our hearts. The prohibition is coveting. And it's interesting, isn't it? The second table of the law, the second set of commands that we've seen before, if it's love your God, Lord your God, with all your heart, soul, your strength, and mind, and your neighbor as yourself. The second table of the law is all about our neighborly uh, response to one another, Um, you know, honoring our parents, not murdering, committing adultery, stealing false uh, testimonies. Your neighbor you shall not cover. And this is very much in the context of covenant community. You know, you covet your neighbor's house. It's... uh, our attitude, isn't it? It's not just our internal attitude, but it's our attitude to one another. It, it, it reveals itself, not just absolutely privately and internally, but it, it reveals itself externally in how we think about and treat our neighbor. So, at one level, we say, well, the, the, the Word of God and, and the, the, the eye of God is in our hearts. It's very private. It's very secret. That's true. But very often, what is in our hearts is revealed by how we live with our neighbor. So, our actions sometimes reveal the intentions of our heart. And so, it's phrased and it's it's molded in in the context of community and in the context of how we treat one another and becomes, therefore, so often the motive, as I say, behind what causes murder and adultery and stealing in community with others. So, it speaks about not coveting, I think not just in a focused, obviously, way in this commandment, but generally not coveting, 
material things, not coveting your neighbor's house, as is uh, summarized here. So, always wanting materially what we don't have, desiring what maybe we don't have because thinking that will bring us happiness, that will bring us contentment, that will bring us fulfillment, that will bring us ultimate meaning in life so that we look at our neighbor and we say, oh man, they've got a great house. I wish my house was like that. They've got a great car. I would love to have a car like them. Or they've got a great job. Or whatever it might be in in material, maybe more material terms than that. A great, it's a, it's a challenge about greed, isn't it? Greed, uh, covetousness can also be translated greed. And it's this uh, prohibition of wanting all the time what we don't have, wanting more clothes, wanting new clothes, wanting bigger and better, envious of what other people have, uh, living our lives in other people's back pockets, wishing we were like them, constantly discontented with what God has gifted to us, what God has given us, ultimately grumbling against Him because we think, you're treating other people better, God. I wish I were like them. Why is their life so good? Why is my life so poor? And it's coveting, it's thinking badly of our neighbor because we're thinking we would rather what they have. They don't deserve it. I do. So, not only does it have a greed within our own hearts, but it, it instills a bad, a bad, uh, uh, bad thoughts towards others who have, because we regard ourselves as being more worthy of what uh, they have than, than they are. And so, there's this great, it, it, it causes discontent, and it causes friction, and it causes unhappiness, and it causes dis, uh, greed in our thinking, in our lives. So, material things, but interestingly also, you shall not cover, covet your neighbor's wife. So, it's not just illegitimate desires for material things, but it's illegitimate desires for other people. Always being discontent with the relationships in which God has placed us. Seeing someone else's wife say, well, or husband, and thinking that person would really be far better with me. I would understand them better. I would treat them better. I would be better with them. Thinking that other person doesn't deserve them. I deserve them. I wish I had them. And so there's this uh, a great. It's so isn't it? Can you see it as it outworks? It's so self-centered because the world revolves around us. That's mine. They should be mine. I should have that person. I should have this. And so, it's, it's replacing God's rightful place and saying, I'm at the center of the universe, and this is what I deserve, and this is what I ought to have, and this is what I ought to be like. And it ultimately is hugely uh, ugly. It, it reveals a misunderstanding about relationships, that they can be quick and move on, as if illicit relationships can provide what steady relationships don't. And it can have all kinds of wrong implications for what we think of each other in community and uh, in church even, feeling a discontent for God and a disregard for others. And just at that very basic level, it reminds us, isn't it, doesn't it, of just our great need. Sometimes we covet because we loathe ourselves. We can't believe God loves us and we can't believe God cares. Sometimes we covet because we love ourselves, because we think God should care far more because we're worth it. And uh, He is not at the center of the universe, we are. And we covet because we want self-service. We want it now and we want it our way. And it leaves us thinking, well, how can I change? How can I change my desires? How can I purify the the undefinable? How can I not covet? I guess we step out of here and and every day we covet. We might not think we're lawbreakers, but every day there'll be elements in our thinking and our desires that, that remind us that we covet. 
that we don't want to be who we are and we don't want to be what we're doing. We're slaves to that. But the great relieving, redeeming hope of the gospel is that Jesus says, I, I, I give you a new life. You, you know, that's why it's so important that we understand being born again. You know, I know a lot of us are brought up in the church and it's been a gentle, a gentle movement into the kingdom. And it hasn't been a radical uh, but rebirth. But the theological truth behind it is so absolutely crucial for us to understand that he, he gives us new desires. And He works in us. And we cooperate with Him to fight to see these new desires transforming us to be like Jesus Christ. And it is a fight. It is for us a fight. But Jesus Christ is up for that and is victorious over death in the grave and is absolutely willing us. And He's not condemning us. He's not uh, exposing us uh, as a ty tyrannical God. He is dealing with us because He loves us. And He says, look, be honest. Be honest with one another and be honest with me and come to me on a daily basis to help transform that coveting heart so that it desires you. Why, why is our worship so significant and important? Well, there's a million answers to that. Uh, but because, or, or what should be important in our, desire, in our worship is that it reveals uh, a transformed heart. You know, just as uh, coveting reveals, reveals itself in our attitude to our community and to our neighbors and to selfishness and pride and all these things, so a heart that's been transformed should be revealed in our worship and in our ongoing attitude to one another. Selfishness is being dealt with by Jesus. And you will go from here and you will be tempted to speak about people and think about people and act towards people in ways that Satan will come in and say, it's okay to think that way. It's okay to live that way. It's okay to deal that way with one another. But what we really want to impress on each other is the Holy Spirit transforming power for every day and every part of our community living as Christians. What then, as we close, do we have to do other than fall on our knees before Christ? Well, we simply need to put Him first, don't we? That is what He asks in Matthew 6, 33, where He's often kind of uh, elucidating, going through the commandments again, and, and kind of with His incarnate New Testament uh, understanding and, and uh, application, he says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Isn't that great? He's just saying, please, just put me first. When we covet, it's other things we put first because we think they will bring us happiness. We think they will change our life. We think they will bring us joy. And we are all battling with these things. And he says, please, just put me first. I've gone to the cross for you. I love you uh, with no greater love, not even a greater, even if it was just a, the greatest human love, it would be amazing. But this is the greatest divine love. And he says, I've gone to the cross for you. And he says, I can't do any more. Put me first and I'll give you the things you need. I'll give you the things that will bring you blessing and joy because I love you and I'm your father, I'm your brother, I'm your friend. And I'm the holy God, yes. But seek me first. Put my kingdom and my righteousness first in your life and these things will be added to you as well. That is so crucial to us, isn't it? He's reminding us when he says that that we can't, in Luke 16, 13, we can't serve two masters. We simply can't do it. No servant can serve two masters. You cannot serve both God and money. And so there's the, there's the challenge that we covet what we don't have. We wish we had a bigger bank account so we could buy more things and be happier and maybe impress other people and get them on our side. And he says, look, it's all about understanding the desires that come through grace and the sins that we need rescued from and the wholeness that he has come to give us. 
So the great gospel message, the great message of the commands is that good desires, which we all want, don't we? We all want good desires. We all want our good desires. Sometimes we quibble about what maybe these good desires will be, but we all recognize that we want good desires to come from our hearts. And if we acknowledge God, then we acknowledge that He is good God. And we can take comfort that we can get our good desires from God, that He can give us a vibrant heart beating Christianity, because He's done major heart surgery spiritually. And we don't, therefore, have this massive tension always of looking like one thing on the outside. I'm supposed to be a Christian. I profess to be a Christian. This is how I should act. But I'm miserable. I'm miserable inside because all my desires are wild and dark, and they're different from what I'm supposed to be because we've kept Jesus out here, and we haven't taken Him in here, and we haven't let Him do this radical uh, reworking, remolding of what we are from the inside out, because that's what He wants to do, so we can have a thirst for God and a desire for God, and uh, that comes from an rela- ongoing relationship with Him in prayer and, and seeking His will primarily, first and foremost, to work within us, Prayers maybe ought not always to be, Lord, change everyone else. Please change the church. Please, Lord, change the minister. Please change my circumstances. Please change uh, my relationships. Lord, please change me. Please change me. And that enables us as we wrestle with him, I believe, to uh, learn uh, contentment. Uh, Paul spoke powerfully of that in uh, Philippians chapter 4, didn't he? From his prison cell, Philippians 4, verse 11. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. And in a favorite verse of the athletes as they win their race and lift up their vest, and they've got another vest underneath which says, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. I'm not sure how often they lift their vest when they've got beaten. It's usually when they've won. But you can lift that vest when you got beaten as well. See, I can do everything through him who gives you strength, and we have learned contentment because we found our identity in Christ. And we don't cover, we don't want to be the great people that we look up to. We just want to be who He has made us because we are uniquely His and we have learned contentment. I just want to finish by reading some verses from 1 Timothy 6, which speaks about godliness. Godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. People who want to to get rich fall into temptation and a trap, and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. You know, hear the, the pastoral concern here. But you, people of God, flee from all of this and pursue righteousness, godliness, and faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of it, the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. A great gospel we have. What a great God and uh, a great Savior. Let's bow our heads and, and pray. Lord God, we thank you for the commandments of God. We thank you that they are so utterly relevant to us, that they both break us down and then through Christ build us up. We thank you that you lived that life. I never touched on this at all tonight, but you lived this perfect life where you didn't covet unbelievably. 
that you lived this perfect life, not just outwardly, but that you had no wrong desires, that you didn't covet what anyone had or any other person in any wrong way that enabled you to face the cross as our substitute and be punished for all our coveting, our greed, our selfish, ugly, misguided and deceived thoughts about ourselves and others. Lord, help us, we pray. Forgive us when we think wrong and act wrong and live wrong. Uh, Help us to be renewed by your Holy Spirit, to love you from the inside out and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Forgive us for our often unkind and self-centered words towards one another, our covetous spirit, for what they have uh, as if you are treating them differently from us and in an unfair way. Lord, may we recognize our uniqueness and also our identity in Jesus. And may we be content where we are with what you have done, knowing that we are your children and that we have eternal life guaranteed through your finished work on the cross. Bless us, we pray, and hear us as we sing together a a returning of our thanks to you for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen.